Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Um, I bring you greetings from North Carolina. Um, and this morning, um, we are, we have found ourselves in a very defining moment in Earth's history. For many of us, what is happening in the news, what is happening in the world right now, um, is something that is what some people would call a watershed moment. We are being faced with decisions, and this issue that is going on right now is not allowing people to be neutral. And neutrality is something that is not being permitted. It is a situation in which hearts are being revealed, and people are showing their true colors on various issues that we may have thought were done away with the moment that, at least in America, we had elected an African-American president. But obviously, that's not the case. This is also stirring up issues of discrimination and prejudice across the world, where there were protests in Australia, in Europe, um, and other places around the world in which this was being confronted. And people were calling out certain individuals who were going to be no longer allowed to walk around with hidden biases and to allow systemic discrimination against any group of people. Unfortunately, for many of us, this is a lot bigger than um, just race. There is discrimination of various kinds across the world. And I'm going to talk a little bit today of what I would title my message, The God You Cannot See. The God That You Cannot See. In dealing with how Jesus has led the way against racism and every other form of discrimination. This was actually a portion of Jesus's ministry. He was intentional. He was focused upon it. And he engaged in it in a way that I think is worthy of our imitation and our example. God is calling upon us as especially youth who have a gravity towards radical behavior. We believe in things that get to the root, which is what the word radical means. And the root of the cause is not going to come in political changes. Although laws need to be updated, policies need to be adjusted. That goes without question. But we understand as biblical Christians that the solutions to the issues in which the world is facing in terms of discrimination in the world is not going to be solved by policy. You cannot legislate righteousness. And in this very spirit is the spirit of my message. So if you would bow your heads with me before we begin. Father in heaven, we are so grateful this morning for the gift of life. Father, you decided that we would live at this time in Earth's history. You decided that this is where you would have us to be. And Lord, we know that what is happening right now across the world and especially across America is something that God had foresaw in your infinite wisdom. And yet, Lord, we believe that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We believe that while it may seem that the rise and fall of movements is based upon the ambition and the desires and the caprice of men, but we know that behind all the play and counterplay, there is God standing the all-merciful one silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will, that you sit above the distractions of the earth, enthroned, that everything is open to your divine vision, and from your great and calm eternity, you order that which your providence sees best. Guide us now, Lord, as we touch on this very sensitive subject, but Lord, we pray that you would guide us into all truth by your spirit. Help us to see Jesus's example to understand it and have the courage to follow him. This is our prayer, and we offer this prayer from our hearts in Jesus' name. 
Amen. I want to begin with a story, a personal story. When I was in the 10th grade, I was living in a suburb of Chicago called Highland Park, Illinois. I had moved from the city where it was predominantly all black to a predominantly Jewish community. I was the only black student uh, probably in my entire grade and maybe one of three in the entire school. And I remember um, I used to be into theater and in theater, um, there was uh, back then life was a little bit different before 9-11, uh, but essentially we could leave school and there was a lot of things that we could do as high school students. Uh, we could go out to the community and eat lunch. We didn't have to eat in the cafeteria. And one of the things we had the option to do were to schedule our theater classes during lunch hours so that we could actually get more credits. We could graduate sooner, explore a lot more things. So you could be in a choir, you could be in acting, you could be in carpentry and learn trades and different things while you're in your lunch hour. And theater was one of my passions back then. And so I remember in one of my theater classes, there was this uh, young lady named Claire and Claire and I actually became really good friends. She was white, but she was not um, Jewish. I didn't know that at first. And so as we became really good friends, it be also became very clear that there was mutual interest. We were talking on the phone all the time. And I remember that one day I had called her and just when you think everything's normal, right? And I um, was really into this girl. And I remember talking to my mother about it. And my mother said to me, Sebastian, I hope that you don't think that because she is white that I would not allow you to date her. And I said, well, no, I mean, I, I wouldn't think that. And the reason why my mother had said that um, had been a family discussion that I'd had previous to that. And this understanding that it was wrong for me as a black man to be in a relationship with a white woman. It was a consideration that I was betraying black women. I was betraying my own race. And so my mother, you know, following up to that discussion, asked me to make, asked me to, you know, did I feel that she felt that way? And I said, no. And she said, I just want you to know that who she is as a person is more important. And so anyway, I, I felt like, oh, that was encouragement. So I moved forward. Unfortunately, Claire's family did not feel that way. And so one day we're on the phone and she started asking me some questions that she wouldn't normally ask me. Oh, you know, what are your plans after high school? Are you planning for the SAT? Are you planning for, you know, where are you going to go when you graduate? And I was like, where are all these questions coming from? Like, we never talk about future college plans and all these types of things. Like when you're 14, 15, that's not normally what you and a girl that you're interested in are having conversations about. It may come up from time to time, but that's not the predominant domineering conversation. And so finally, I was like, hey, is everything all right? Like, why are you asking me all these questions? And apparently, when we had a rehearsal for, a, for one of the plays we were performing for the school, her parents came to the rehearsal and noticed that the young man that she had been talking to on the phone, you know, Sebastian didn't sound like a very black name. And so they had no way of knowing. But when they came to the rehearsal and they realized, oh, that the black kid, that's the kid that you've been talking to, they had to pull her aside and say, hey, you know, what, what exactly is going on? You know, what are his grades? What are, what's going on with his uh, college plans? And all these different things. And so as a result, our relationship really started deteriorating very quickly. I remember subsequent to this experience, there was a girl who was one of the wealthiest girls in our school. Her name was Marissa. She invited me to a birthday party. And when I got to the birthday party, you know, I was the only black person there. And she could tell I made, I'm naturally more introverted anyway. So if you put me in a social situation, I like to be more off to myself or uh, on the side. And so Marissa came over and she said, Sebastian, you know, it's okay. Like you should, you know, join us, you know, participate in the party. And again, you know, I was like, oh yeah, it's no problem. And there were certain people who had attended the party who were asking the question. Of course, they didn't think I could hear them. It's like, oh, why would she invite him? He's black. And in this particular experience, and these two experiences were very meaningful for me at a, at a certain 
formative age of my life because it became apparently clear that certain people had certain biases and prejudices towards me because of the color of my skin. And it was around this very time that my father made me sit down and my sister and watch a series of documentaries back then. They were on VHS cassettes. <laughs> and um, It was called Eyes on the Prize. And it was documenting the experience of Black Americans, especially leading up to the civil rights, Jim Crow laws, et cetera, et cetera. And so I was 14, 15, watching these videos. And I mean, this is like maybe six to 12 cassettes. So we're talking like 10, 12 hours. And I'm learning about Medgar Evers and Marcus Garvey and Martin Luther King Jr. and W.B. Du Bois and George Washington Carver, on and on and on, all these different individuals in African-American history, how things went, how this led to whatever. And I was thinking to myself, like, man, you know, this is really intense. And so every day my dad would come home and ask us when he got home from work, what did we learn from that video? What did we remember? He was quizzing us on this information. And that was the first time after these experiences happened to me and I watched that series that I understood that there was a certain hidden bias against me. It was understood that people were gonna look at me differently and assume certain things about me before I even open my mouth. And in this very experience, being that individual who is viewed in a culture in which you are not the majority, and the understanding of this experience in my life set the backdrop for several things that I was going to go on to accomplish simply because of the fact that I was told that because I was a darker skinned individual, that I needed to be twice as good as everybody else. That I needed to be an individual who couldn't make mistakes. If I make a mistake, it's doubly worse. I wanna to read to you a statement before I jump into my remarks from Ellen White. This is uh, Letters 99, this is written in 1899. And she said this, she said, the desire to show their masterly authority over the blacks is still burning in the hearts of many who claim to be Christians, but whose lives declare that they are standing under the black banner of the great apostate. When the whites commit crimes, they are often allowed to go uncondemned, while for the same transgressions, the blacks are treated worse than the brutes. The demon of passion is let loose and all the suffering that can be devised is instituted against them. Will not God judge for these things? As surely as the whites have brought their inhuman cruelty to bear upon the Negroes, so surely will God's vengeance fall upon them. This is written in 1899. Here we are talking about police brutality against people of color and minorities. And in 1899, we're talking over a hundred years this has been happening. And Ellen White called it out exactly for what it was, that there were whites committing the same crimes, but receiving different treatment and punishment. Some of them not even receiving prosecution. I want to lay a basis in Jesus's example of how to confront this, because I know what I've seen in that documentary series that my father made me watch, I know what I've seen in my own experience with racism of what the expectation is of how you address this. And what I want us to be careful with this morning as we address this topic and look at the example of Jesus is to recognize that we have to engage in every single activity of life on the basis of the word of God. We are told in the great controversy that God would have a people on the face of the earth who would hold the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of every doctrine and as the basis of every reform. That means any teaching should be tested and proved by the word of God. And any actions we take should be based upon clear biblical principles. This is a caution to us when social justice grows and people begin to try to hijack a moral issue and politicize it to move us in a certain direction of behavior, a certain direction of conversation. I want to add another statement. Sister White says, we must free ourselves from the customs and bondage of society. That when the principles of our faith are at stake, 
we shall not hesitate to show our colors, even though we are called singular for so doing. You see, if we're not careful, we get so caught up in the political activity and response and protest of how these things happen, that when the time comes where all of a sudden religious liberty is restricted, all of a sudden when the principles of our faith are called into question or at stake, it's harder for us to show our colors. Because we have to recognize the way the discussion is happening right now is not Christian. The way the discussion is coming out right now, we can be polarizing and alienate a section of souls in the universe that God has sent us to save. And so we have to look at the example of Jesus. We cannot look to social movements. We cannot look to nonprofits and NGOs. We cannot look to political leaders to tell us how to engage in this. We have to go back to the Bible. We have to recognize that, yes, as I quoted from Sister White, she recognized systemic racism in the treatment of Blacks when it came to the commitment of crimes, how they were treated, and what the results were, saying that they were treated worse than animals and that the demons of passion were let loose upon them, and every single conceived evil was instituted against them. So she recognizes, and we call it out, but at the same token, we cannot engage in this thing simply from a political perspective or a social perspective. We have to look at it from a biblical perspective. And so allow me to look at experiences. I want to look at three passages this morning of how Jesus confronted the issues of racism in his time and discrimination. We recognize that this is embedded in many of the experiences in the New Testament. This was the issue that was coming up even in the book of Acts, was the issue of discrimination. They may have done it on the basis of religion and origin. You are not of Abrahamic origin. You're a Gentile. Therefore, we can't eat with you. We can't interact with you. But Jesus confronted it even in his day. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go with me to the Gospel of John, in John chapter 4. Now, in John chapter 4, Jesus is meeting with a woman at the well. We already know the story, and I'm not going to sit here and retell the whole story. But I, what I want us to do is look at that Jesus' dealings with Samaritans in his ministry is a blueprint for how he confronted discrimination in his day. You can call it racism. You can call it tribalism in Africa. You can call it differences even in Asia of clans. And this recognition that we know exactly the history, or many of us may not know, the history between the Japanese and the Koreans. We may not know the interaction between the French and the Cambodians and the types of genocides that have happened. Even if we go back to 1994, Rwanda was Hutus versus Tutsis. This is not just an issue of racism. This is an issue of prejudice and discrimination against any particular group of people. And there are social rules that are created of how we're supposed to interact and engage with these people. And let's not even pretend like it's not present in England. I've been to England many a time. And I'll never forget the conversation I had with a man who told me that, Sebastian, you know, we're not English, we're British. Because as soon as you have color in your skin, they'll call you British, but you are not English. And I looked at this person, I'm like, what are you talking about? What is the difference? They said, well, if you're white, you're considered English. If you're black, you're considered British. And there's this understanding that there's a certain level you will never cross. There's a certain level of acceptance that will never come even in British society. And I'm thinking to myself, so you could be born here for generations but you're not English, you're British. There's this systemic view of saying that you will always be a migrant. You will always be a foreigner here. Built into it. And please believe that the longer and longer this discussion happens, the more and more systemic issues will be called out, not just in America, but all across the world. And the understanding of these principles, which is why I felt it was so important to look at the example of Christ. In John chapter 4, beginning in verse 3, the Bible says that Jesus left Judea 
and he departed again into Galilee. Verse 4 says, and he must needs go through Samaria. Now, this very point is huge because separated between Judea and Galilee, Judea was in the south, Galilee was in the north. And Jesus is saying, oh yeah, I have to, I'm leaving Judea and I'm going north. And as I'm going north from the south, I have, Samaria was a little piece of ground that was between them. But normally because of the bad blood between the Jews and the Samaritans, it was often that Jews would be injured or attacked passing through Samaria. And so because of this attack that would happen, most of the time Jews would go around because they knew what would happen if they passed through Samaria. Here Jesus says, I have to go through Samaria. Jesus leads the way in John chapter 4 by showing us this first point, which is that as a Christian, as a biblical Christian, as a disciple of Jesus, we are called to break social rules of discrimination. We are called to transgress those social rules that seek to divide us from other people. You can't tell me because I have democratic views politically that I can't engage with Republicans. You can't tell me that because I'm a millennial, I can't engage with baby boomers. You can't tell me that because I'm a black man, me and a white man are not able to have a relationship and grow in mentorship and professional development. You cannot tell me that because I have a business that women cannot sit upon my board because they're too emotional. You can't say because I'm in the military that all of a sudden a woman is not able to make the same wise decisions as a commander, as a man. You cannot allow me to engage in this type of discrimination. Jesus automatically began to break the social rules of his time. He crossed the boundary into uncomfortable territory. And we know that it was uncomfortable because of the shock of the woman and the disciples of Jesus when they saw him talking to this woman. But before I get there, I want you to understand why they marveled. Notice with me in verse 9. The Bible says, Then say of the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Let me just flesh out what that word dealings is talking about. Number one, we have to recognize that as a Jew and a Samaritan, the Samaritans were created back in 2 Kings chapter 14 and 15, where essentially this city was set up for idolatry. It was the mingling of Jews intermarrying with Gentiles of that region. And they ended up setting up their own type of worship, idolatry, Ahab and Ahaz and all kinds of other issues that were going. So the Jews always looked down upon the Samaritans as if they were half-breeds, as if they were less than human. And so this understanding that a Jew, you would never be able to have any dealings with a Samaritan. You wouldn't talk to them. You wouldn't touch them. You wouldn't interact with them. This was so huge that if a Samaritan entered a village, particularly a Samaritan woman, the village, the entire village was considered unclean. And a Samaritan woman was considered perpetually unclean. So here in these social rules, automatically Jesus says, I must needs go through Samaria. That means you and I have to think about the people that are socially outcast in church, the people that are being discriminated and stereotyped against even in our community. And we are called as biblical Christians, as disciple of Jesus, to engage, to break these social rules that seek to remove people from us for the sake of the gospel. You see, this is how we understand and understand how to preach the gospel in a way in which the world can see how powerful it is. I want to tell you the story of a woman in South Africa when this whole apartheid thing was happening. And these individuals, when this woman was away, from home, her daughter was just home from college. She was a white South African woman. And all of a sudden, these fighters came to her home. Her daughter was home from college. They broke in, raped her daughter, and killed her. Her daughter was 22 years old, just graduated from college. She didn't even know that this had took, taken place. She came back home to find the media outside of her home. As she arrived there, they said, ma'am, uh, and she's trying to figure out what's going on. She heard from the news TV station 
that her daughter had been allegedly raped and killed by these black Africans in South Africa who were fighting for apartheid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of a sudden, she looks at the camera and they're like, do you have anything to say? And you can only imagine certain people who are racist in that country waiting for her to say something to ignite. And she looked at the camera and she said, I just want whoever did this to know that I forgive you. Everybody was completely shocked. But you see, she wasn't even done yet. The man was eventually caught and imprisoned. And when he got out of prison years later, because of who he was and what he represented, no one would offer him a job. No one would offer him a place to stay. No one would offer him any help or assistance because of the curse that was over his life because of what he had done. The woman went and found this man and told him that he could live in her house. She employed him in her house. Let him sleep in the very room in which he violated and killed her daughter. And then she went on later on to do an interview and said, he is like my son. You have to recognize that this woman was showing us as a Christian and disciple of Jesus, that she was not going to allow herself to be bound by the customs and social rules of her time. She was not going to allow discrimination and prejudice and racism and tribalism and colors and whatever other divide that people were going to try to make in order to prevent her from being like Jesus. Some of us are going to be held back from Christ's likeness because of how we engage in discussions of controversy, because of how we engage in discussions of discrimination. Jesus calls us to follow his example and to break social rules that hold us back from finishing the work of spreading the gospel to all the world in this generation. He said, I have to go through Samaria. But the second thing that we also see is not only was this issue of Samaria, but this was the fact that this was a woman of Samaria. See, there were Jewish rules, ridiculous social rules, that said that it was inappropriate and unacceptable for a man to talk to a woman in public, even if she was your wife. So if you're walking in the street, you could not talk to a woman in public. And here is Jesus talking to a woman in public at the well. They, basically, they would look at you like, you must be crazy. You must be out of your mind. And we know this, that this grew even further in Corinthians and even in Timothy when it's talking about a woman to learn in silence because these women were speaking up in church. And this issue of the fact that in Christianity, we encourage women to embrace the fact that God had made them in the image of God, that they had minds to be developed and they had questions and they should be able to engage in worship but it was trying to guide them in a way not to keep them silent or to say their opinions don't matter, but just to bring order to the service. But you see, people would try to take these things and in order to perpetuate, again, these prejudices and forms of discrimination and sexism. And here is Christ breaking the social rules of his time. The third thing that we see here is not only is he going through Samaria, not only is he talking to a woman, but he's talking to a woman of Samaria who wasn't even a noble person. She is obviously of questionable character. And we know this because, number one, the Bible tells us in verse 6, it says, Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, he sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, which means this was 12 p.m. in the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day. If you have your Bibles, I want you to keep your finger here and go with me to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24 to see this concept of wells and how this was engaged in. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 24, beginning in verse 10, the story of Eleazar going to the well, it says, and the servant put his hand under the thigh, I'm sorry, and the servant took 10 camels of the camels of his master and departed. For all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time 
that women go out to draw water. So this tells you that women normally would come out to draw water in the evening. And this is how he met Rebecca. So Rebecca, as an upstanding woman, she wouldn't come there in the middle of the day. It was the hottest part of the day. Why would you go there in the middle of the day? But you see, not only were they going there in the evening because it was the temperature was cooler, but they also went there in the middle of the evening because there weren't travelers. Nobody was passing through at that time. So people would normally be in for the night. They would be where they were going to be and nobody would be passing by the well. And so there was no threat of men and different issues that we know in other parts of Genesis would happen when Jacob met Rachel and the men were preventing them, right, from drawing water from the well. So we see that you're going to avoid there in the middle of the day when travelers are passing through. But this woman is coming, according to John chapter 4, at the sixth hour to draw water, not in the evening. This tells us two things about her. Not only is she an outcast from the Jews, she's even an outcast among the Samaritans. And even further than this, this raises the fact that she's of questionable character. As Jesus says, yeah, you have had five husbands and the one you're with now is not your husband. So usually prostitutes would come into public places like wells and by the road when Tamar met Judah and pretended to be a prostitute. They would come places where people were traveling, where men would be so they could find more men. So the belief here is that even the text could be insinuating, as some scholars suggest, that she was coming to this well to find another man, hoping to meet another traveler because she was also a woman of questionable character. So here is Jesus, again, breaking these social rules, talking to a woman in public, talking to a woman of Samaria and having dealings with Samaritans and the belief that a woman of Samaria was perpetually unclean and that Jesus would be defiling himself, that he would be unclean. Now, in looking at all of this, what we see Jesus doing is he laying aside the cultural baggage of his time. He's shattering these cultural rules and showing that, number one, as a Christian, in our own personal example in life, we must engage in the breaking of cultural rules and boundaries that seek to divide us as human beings in order to spread the gospel. You see, when the disciples came back, we notice that the disciples were shocked. I want you to notice in John chapter 4 and in verse 27. It says, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, come see a man. So now we have a situation where this woman at the well, probably looking for another man, and she found Jesus. And as she finds Jesus, her true bridegroom, her true mate, the true match for her soul. And in this individual, Christ is like, I'm not into affairs with you. I'm not into this sort of uncommitted relationship with you. Jesus was the one that said, I know your questionable past. I know what the social rules say about this relationship. I know everything that culturally is going to come up against me, but I'm shattering those things because I'm not going to see you through the eyes of culture. I'm not going to see you through the eyes of history. I'm not going to see you through the eyes of my own people and the prejudices that they have. I'm going to see you through the eyes of God. I'm going to see you through the eyes of your maker and of your creator. I'm going to look at you as a soul that needs to be saved, that is desperate for the water of life. And therefore, I am willing to break and transgress every cultural rule of my time in order to reach a soul that ended up bringing many other souls to Christ. The first example that Jesus leaves for us in John chapter 4 is to transgress the social rules and customs of our time that bring about discrimination and separation in humanity. You see, this applies not just in racism, it applies in tribalism. It applies in generation. Oh yeah, millennials, we get tired of baby boomers. Baby boomers start talking about how millennials are lazy. They don't want to do their job. And any other way that the devil can find to bring separation between individuals by age, by color, by gender, by all these different things, even as men, we have to be careful. Our perception that women are weaker, they're more emotional, they can't make great decisions. 
I remember I heard one person say that on average, men have higher IQs than women, therefore they should be leaders. It's ridiculous. When God created Adam and Eve, the Bible says, let them have dominion. That means not just Adam, but also Eve. The animals obeyed Eve the same way they obeyed Adam. The plant life, Ellen White says, would bow to Adam's word, and they would also bow to Eve's word. It is also men and women who will be in heaven and sitting on Christ's throne. They will also receive crowns of life. They will also sit and judge angels, just like a man would, because God created them for that purpose. And yet in this very sense, we can say, oh yeah, we don't want her to lead. We don't want her to be a part of the committee. We don't want her to kind of lead out in the small group because we have certain prejudices and discriminations. But Jesus broke and transgressed these things and he calls us to do the same. Now I wanna take you to the second thing in Luke chapter nine. Luke chapter nine, we see another instance of Samaritans and how Christ made it his business to address these things. Luke chapter nine, beginning in verse 51. The Bible says, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. So I want you to notice here, John chapter four, Jesus has already been accepted by the Samaritans. They're coming to see a man who does not fall into the usual stereotypes. That's why the woman invited them. She went into Samaria. She didn't go to get Jews. She went to get more Samaritans. So these Samaritans are coming back and they're thinking, man, this man was talking to this woman of Samaria and he's a Jew. They want to come see this particular man who violates all these social rules that the Jews have set up. This belief that we are supposed to act as if Samaritans don't even exist. And now Jesus is about to be received up into heaven. And the Bible says he sent messengers so that he could have a place in a Samaritan village. He didn't even just accept the people and minister to them. He even received their hospitality. He was willing to go and live and stay there on his way to Jerusalem. But even then, this is the crazy thing. The Samaritans were upset that because he was planning to go to Jerusalem, they didn't want to make a place for him. Not in that particular village. So because of this, they said, nah, we're not going to do that. So they didn't receive Jesus. Verse 54. And when his disciples, James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? But he turned and he rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the son of man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they just went to another village. There are two principles that come out in the second lesson that Jesus teaches us on engaging in discussions on racism in any other form of prejudice and discrimination. Jesus says, number one, you need to be careful of the spirit in which you are of. We have now engaged in a discussion and the way that people are talking online and we are buying into popular media about how to treat people who are racist, who are discrimination driven. Jesus says, you need to be careful because some of us are engaging in discussion that, well, if this man is racist or that woman is racist or this person said the N word and therefore we're trying to destroy men's lives. Jesus did not come to destroy a man's life. Jesus came to save men's lives. And therefore, as we engage in the discussion, which we should be engaged in by our own example, breaking the cultural rules that feed into systemic racism and discrimination, 100% we should do it, but we need to be careful of the spirit in which we are of. We need to be careful in the spirit in which we engage in discussion. I watch people on Facebook. I watch them on Instagram. I watch them on Twitter get into discussions and say, oh, this guy is a racist. I tell people all the time, I can find very few things that me and my president agree on. There's probably maybe one thing in the entire world that he and I agree on. But please believe that if I had the opportunity to preach the good news to Donald Trump and to lead him to Jesus, I would. 
and I would put aside whatever it would be that would prevent him from being willing to listen to the gospel if God gave me the opportunity. You can almost be sure that I have met and worked with people who were racist. No question in my mind. I have worked under people who are racist. But if we are engaging in a discussion in such a way that we alienate individuals, then the devil wins. Because the devil understands that, oh yeah, it's so bad, this racism and discrimination and police brutality. And I agree with you. The police officers who committed these things should be held accountable and laws should be passed and policies should be enacted to prevent such evils like Breonna Taylor, who was killed because the police were at the wrong house and they didn't even knock, busted in, and her boyfriend started shooting, was killed, and she was killed, simply because they had the wrong information. So now there's a rule, God, you know, thank God, now in Kentucky that police have to knock and announce themselves in order to prevent such a tragedy. Praise God, we appreciate it, and that's exactly what should happen in many other places where this is going on. But at the same token, it does not mean that we want to destroy the lives of people because they are racist. We are not interested in destroying men's lives. Jesus was not interested in that. He did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And we have to be careful that the Bible talks about if your brother offends you, you go to your brother between him and you alone. But you see, right now we have this trend that private conversations with people are being put out in public notice and saying, oh, we're calling you out as a racist. We're calling you out as an individual. And I'm saying, if you know that this person has said something that is a racial slur or racially offensive, the Bible says you go to him and that person alone, and you confront that fault there. It is not for us to put out people's faults and evils. What if people decided, you know, I'm going to find all people who are addicted to pornography, and I'm going to put all their stuff out there. And if I'm going to put all these people out here that I know this guy was disrespecting this person and his wife, and therefore I'm going to put him out there, that does not save a man's life. The purpose of Christianity, the purpose of Jesus's example is to call a person back to God. But you see now in the way the discussion is being had, we are alienating individuals and souls. So the moment I come out and say, oh, Black Lives Matter or this all lives matter. All lives matter is just code language for racial people who don't want to say black lives matter. And I agree on principle that it's true. Black lives matter does not mean black lives matter more. That's not what they're trying to say. They're trying to say they matter too. They matter as well. But we have to be careful that we are not of the spirit that the devil was putting in James and John, who were disciples of Jesus. And these were faithful disciples of Jesus. These were, these were among the inner circle of Christ, of his closest disciples. And yet the spirit came upon them, probably driven by the fact that they were Samaritans. This silent, hidden bias and prejudice. Should we call down fire to destroy them? And you're saying, well, James and John, where was that same energy when the Pharisees were not accepting Jesus? Where was that same energy when they went over to this village and all they're like, oh, Jesus commits, you know, cast out demons by Beelzebub. I didn't see you wanting to call fire down from heaven on them. So all of a sudden when we come and we say, oh yeah, we're, we need to call these people out and do it and confront this. Well, we have to bring that same energy to every type of sin, every type of struggle, every type of evil. God hates all sin. And the recognition that God doesn't just hate the sins that we hate, he hates the sins that we love. And in this very sense, we got to be careful in the spirit in which we engage in this discussion. You can be sure I have suffered enough racism and discrimination in my life that if I were not surrendered to the Jesus Christ, if I was not surrendered to the Lord, I already know the things that I would be saying right now in this discussion. I already know people that I could call out. I already know people that I could put on blast and say, yep, you said this and this, but this is exactly what you did. And I got the paperwork to prove it. But you see in this, we say, oh, see, it calls out our cause and it brows people up and they get angry. But our goal is not to destroy them. Our goal is to save them. And we have to be careful how we engage this discussion.
people may disagree. I want a person to feel so comfortable in my presence that they would be willing to tell me to my face that they don't trust black people. I want to be the type of Christian that someone could say to me to my face, Sebastian, I know that I feel sometimes uncomfortable around people of color. I feel as if sometimes my wife or my daughters are not safe around them. I don't know if I would feel comfortable with my daughter marrying a black man. And please believe there's people in Adventism that aren't comfortable with their daughters marrying a black man. They're not going to come out and say that. They're going to try to quote Ellen White. And Ellen White says, oh, she discouraged white and black people getting together, da 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 because this was a time in racism. And now we're trying to bring this up to the 21st century as if the principle of what she was saying doesn't apply. No, the principle is if your marriage is going to create issues for you and your children, it is an unwise marriage. It doesn't matter if you're black and white. It could be Japanese and Koreans. I mean, there's plenty of Korean mothers and grandmothers who would never stand for their daughters to marry a Japanese man because of what the Japanese did to Korean women, because of how they treated them. When you go back to Hutus and Tutsis in Rwanda, the Hutus used rape as a weapon of war. They raped these Tutsi women eight hours a day just to discourage them from ever wanting to have children. There's no question that a Tutsi woman is going to be have a certain feeling about her daughter marrying a Hutu man because of what that because of the history that's present. But this is where the power of the gospel comes in. We have to learn and allow the gospel to overcome every hereditary and cultivated tendency to wrong. We have to show the world that the gospel is able to break down every single barrier like this. That yes, we know the history between Hutu and Tutsi. We know the history between Japanese and Korean. But because of the gospel, because of the power of the grace of Christ, we are able to transcend this evil, evil history. We're able to show that the gospel has brought together individuals whom history and the devil would always have had apart, miles apart. And when we engage in the discussion, we can hate the sin and love the sinner at the same time. We can engage in a discussion where we condemn the behavior, but do not condemn the person. Because a man is a racist or a woman is a racist doesn't make them lost. It makes them in need of a savior. This is the second point that Jesus taught us in his engagement with discrimination. We have to be careful, the spirit in which we engage people who disagree. People may mistreat us. People may have said some things sideways. And I've been there, just like probably most people have. But as a Christian, I am called to love those who hate me. That's what it means to be like God. Because we're, as we're going to see in our very last point for this morning, if we turn over to Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, Jesus mentions Samaritans again. But this time in Luke chapter 10, he uses it in the story of what we call the good Samaritan. The Bible says that Jesus is having a discussion with the lawyer. And he says, oh, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And as he's talking to this lawyer about the greatest commandment of the law, Jesus says, well, what does the Bible say? And the lawyer says, oh, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And then he said unto him, Jesus said, you've answered right. This do, and you shall do likewise and love your neighbor as yourself. Then the man looks at him in verse 29 of Luke chapter 10, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Now, I want you to think about this very powerfully. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the question the man asked is, who is my neighbor? Who am I supposed to love as myself? Now, I want you to think about right embedded in that statement is all the discrimination and racism you can find. Oh, everyone is not my neighbor. I'm not called to love everybody as myself. So I'm trying to clarify here, who exactly is my neighbor? Who am I supposed to love as myself? And Jesus, 
in a very twist, says there was a Jew who was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And while he was traveling, we know the story, he fell among thieves, they stripped him of his clothes and left him half dead. And as they left him half dead, we know that by chance in verse 31, there came down a certain priest that way. By chance, he just happened to be passing by. By chance, he just happened to be in that area. By chance, he just happened to take that path to the temple that day. In the providence of God, he had allowed the priest to see a man in need of his own countrymen. Half dead, beaten and stripped of his clothes. And in this particular man that he saw, the Bible says he went, when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. He did not help the man because he didn't see him. See, you could easily say, right, to someone right now, looking at the discussions happening around race in the world and discrimination in the world, they can say, well, I never saw it. But you see, this is the problem that what George Floyd had brought to the surface is the fact that people saw it. When they saw that video, which I have not watched because there's no way I can watch that. My wife had told me there's such a thing as secondary trauma. And in looking at this particular video, I know all the details. I've read it all. I've listened to the, the transcript, all those different things. What George Floyd did in that video that was published and went viral was the fact that there is a young girl who years before, I'm talking about decades before this even happened in the civil rights, where there was a white cop stepping on a black girl's neck with his foot on her neck. This ain't the first time that this has happened in the world. But you see, the difference was there was no camera. There was no social media. There was no way for people to see the hatred and the discrimination. But you see, when this video came out, now you could not ignore it. You saw it. His hands in his pocket, kneeling on the man's neck, heard the man calling for his mother, and he still knelt upon his neck, telling him that he couldn't breathe, still knelt upon his neck, and watched as the man literally sucked his life out. And in this moment, when people watch, now you saw him. And the question is, are you going to help the man or are you going to pass by on the other side? The thing that is shocking to me is that it is recorded. It's the fact that a person can record something and watch what's happening and not intervene. And this is why it's hard for me to watch certain things because my nature is to intervene. I can already know, and my wife will always say this, it is a blessing that you are not in certain situations because I already know what you would do. If I was in Minnesota in that situation, for sure, I would have probably jumped and tackled the cop, probably ended up dead, and I wouldn't have been able to make this sermon appointment because I would have been killed. Because there's no question in my mind, there's no way I'm going to let myself watch another man kneel on another man's neck. No way, no how. I don't care if he's white, black, blue, or purple. I cannot stand by and watch it happen. I was trained in the military. I'm a Marine. In my mind, I was trained to protect the rights of every single American. Doesn't matter his color. And in this very sense, the Bible says the priest saw him and he passed by on the other side. You and I have to recognize Jesus is showing us. When we talk about who is our neighbor, true religion is about the recognition that I am called as a Christian to help every single person in need. And if I see that a man is beaten, left half dead, stripped on the side, and I see him, I cannot pass by on the other side. There's no way you could see what happened to that man Brianna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and so many other people over the years. And recognize, you can't pass by on the other side. That's why this discussion is uncomfortable for people. Because see, for the priest, he could pass by on the other side, nobody saw him. But you see, now in 2020, you pass by on the other side, people are going to call you out. I notice that you are, uh, you know, uncharacteristically quiet. I notice that you're not really saying anything about this issue. I notice that you're not really speaking up about this issue. You're passing by on the other side. Then a Levite comes, 
passing by on the other side. The same thing. So in looking at this moment, Jesus says all of a sudden in verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he had compassion upon him. I want you to think about the fact that this is a moment that is more powerful than you can imagine in the listeners in Jesus' mind. These Jews treated Samaritans as if they were unclean. These Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. They would not accept a business deal. They would not pass through their country. They would not talk to them. They would not show hospitality to them. They treated them as if they did not exist, as if they were less than human beings. They considered them questionable in character because they were Samaritan for no other reason. There is guarantee, no way, that if the Samaritan were in the reverse situation, that a Jew would help him. And Jesus tells a story and says, the very man who has been despised, who has been downtrodden, mistreated, looked at as secondary class of human being, this person passes by and has compassion on a man who would have left him for dead if he were in the same situation. You see, brothers, and sisters, this lets us know that Jesus is teaching us that Christ as the Samaritan in racism, in discrimination, Jesus says, yes, that is exactly the vitriol that sin has brought in our hearts against God. We have to recognize that we were always racist against the divine race. We were always discriminating against God. And many people in this world still discriminate against God. They have prejudices, things that they assume about God and who he is and how he functions. And in this particular prejudice, we were born racist against God. We were born racist against our own creator. Automatic prejudices against him and who he is and what his purposes are. This is why we don't surrender to his will. This is why we don't study his word. This is why we don't engage in full worship and service to God because we have certain prejudices. And when heaven came down and sent Jesus to come and die for us, that means that the Bible is telling us that the very person we despise, that one that the Bible says no one seeks after God, no, not one, yet that very person, the Samaritan of the universe, the Samaritan of the earth, who was God in Christ, coming down to help a person that would have left him for dead if he were in the same situation. He comes down and he has compassion upon him. This was the moment where the Samaritan forgave every time a Jew mistreated him. This is the moment where the Samaritan said, the need of this man has called me out of my situation of discrimination, of separation. Because the Samaritan said, I cannot leave this man in this condition. I can't pass by on the other side. So on one level, it lets us know it is impossible for us to be a Christian and to ignore the plight of minorities in any country of the world. See, when I was in Germany, I remember how they looked at Albanian people coming to their country. And there were certain stereotypes against them. But you see, as a true Christian, we cannot allow and pass by on the other side while people mistreat somebody else of a different group because of something that, of which they can never change about themselves. Jesus calls us, he says, as a Samaritan, and I'm calling upon every single person of color, every single minority, a woman, a person of Asian descent, a person of Hispanic descent, a person of any other minority in which you have been mistreated. Christianity, true religion says, I need to provide a certain level of compassion and love to a man, to a woman who would have never provided it for me. Jesus showed us through the parable of the Good Samaritan. He says, who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is the person who is in need. No matter how they've treated you, no matter what the discrimination has been, no matter what the history has been, 500 years is what this history has been between Jews and Samaritans. And when Christ told the disciples before he ascended to heaven, he said in Acts chapter one and verse eight, you shall receive power 
after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. He included it as a process of spreading the gospel. It was assumed that our commission from Christ compels us to break down the social rules and discriminations of our day. The gospel compels us to not have a spirit of judgment against those who do not receive us. But Jesus says we have to learn to be a good Samaritan. A good Samaritan is cold language for a good black man who has been discriminated against and systematically been depressed and oppressed. That's a good Samaritan. A good Samaritan is a good woman who has been put down because she is a woman, neglected opportunities because she is a woman, but she offers a compassion and a service that would have never been granted to her put in the same position. Because it is a call for us to look at the example of Jesus and to recognize engaging in this discussion on race and discrimination. Christ says you have to break the social rules. Christ says you have to be careful of the spirit in which you engage with those who disagree. Christ says we have to recognize who is our neighbor. I want to read this quote before I come towards the end of my story, my sermon. It says here to us, thus the question, who is my neighbor, is forever answered. Christ has shown that our neighbor does not mean merely one of the church or faith to which we belong. It has no reference to race, color, or class distinction. Our neighbor is every person who needs our help. Our neighbor is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. For the spirit we manifest toward our fellow man declares what is our spirit toward God. I'm gonna need to read that again. For the spirit we manifest towards our fellow man declares what is our spirit toward God? This is why there's no room for racism in the church. This is why there is no room for discrimination against the woman in our church. This is why there's no room for discrimination against a millennial or a baby boomer because of someone's age or generation in our church. Because what the Bible is trying to let us know is the person you love the least is equal to your love to God. The person in which you love the least is equal to your love to God. The spirit that you have towards any human being is the spirit that you and I have towards God. We need to be careful. As I told you in the beginning, George Floyd's memorial was a mile away from my house. Right before his memorial, they were trying to contain a riot in a particular city in America. And the soldiers had their gear, the police officers had their gear and their mask and everything. And this one police officer during the protest had gotten separated from his unit. And a whole bunch of protesters were heading for him. And they were gonna take his life. They're gonna beat him to death, no question. And a group of protesters, black protesters, built a wall around him and they said, if you're gonna destroy him, you're gonna to have to kill us first. When I saw that, it was the greatest picture of what it means to be a Christian. It is the picture of what we ought to be in the discussion right now. But I told you that this is message is entitled to God we don't see. For eight minutes and 46 seconds, George Floyd lived his last minutes on earth under the knee of a man that hated him because of the color of his skin. There has been protests all over the world ignited because of the death of this man, because we watched him die. And people said enough is enough. It is the death of this man 
unfortunately, it cost his life to lead to the protests and the outrage and the conversations that are being had right now. But when I look at that situation, I automatically go to the person of Jesus. And the old Negro spiritual that says, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And the song says, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Were you there? What we don't realize is that video of George Floyd watching him die. We were actually watching the death of Christ. If we've truly seen Jesus face down to the earth with the knee of sin on his neck, crushing the life out of his soul, and recognizing that at the end of the video, he started calling for his mother. What do you think Jesus did on the cross? He called his father. As sin was crushing his life. Out of his very being. It is the death of Jesus. That should lead to a lifelong protest against sin. People must be careful that they, that we, I'm not, I'm not excluding myself. We must be careful that by engaging in a righteous cause, that we think that God is just going to overlook the sins in our lives. That we're going to make ourselves feel better because we feel like we're on the moral side of an issue. But the true protest of a Seventh-day Adventist Christian is to protest the sin that knelt upon the neck of Jesus. So when you leave this call and you go home and decide how you're going to keep the Sabbath, you protest because you watched him die. When you go home tonight and the Sabbath is over and you're sitting in your room by yourself and you're tempted to watch pornography and to masturbate and engage in all kinds of lustful practices, you remember that that very sin that is what you need to protest because that's what knelt upon the neck of Jesus because you watched him die. When you go home and you decide how you're going to speak to people and the disrespect that sometimes we bring on social media, remember that it was that same disrespect, that same hatred, that same anger that knelt upon the neck of Jesus and we watched him die. It is a reminder that God is calling us to a heavenly protest. That the government of this world, the devil, we need to protest. Unjust laws are made to be broken. Unjust social rules are made to be broken. And the reason why we are against racism is because we watched him die. It's impossible for you to watch that video and not be touched. But I would tell people it's impossible for us to truly understand what took place at the cross and not be touched. Because for many of us, we can protest racism, but we're not protesting sin in our own lives. And that's what knelt upon the neck of Jesus. My challenge to each and every one of us today on this Sabbath is to resolve in our hearts to break the social rules of discrimination. My challenge is engage in the discussion, but make sure you know what spirit you are of. Be careful how we treat people we disagree with. Be careful how we treat people because of their racist and their darkest mistakes. We need to be a good Samaritan. We need to offer compassion and service to those who would never have offered it to us the same. That's true Christianity. We can't pass by on the other side. 
And last but not least, there in the life of George Floyd, as it seeped out, we saw the God we cannot see. Because the Bible says, how can you love God who you don't see if you hate your brother who you do see? It didn't qualify it. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Father, for your word this morning. Father, you know how heavy my heart was on this message. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would have helped me to represent your heart correctly. That your will would have been presented in the example of Jesus, rightly understood. Father, we ask in a special way for your spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage to break the rules of discrimination and prejudices in our churches. The rules, the social rules that lead us to division by political views, by preferences, by certain beliefs and attitudes. Lord, we pray that you would unearth those hidden biases from our hearts. We all have them. But Father, we need in a special way your grace to speak to us. We need your grace to keep us, Lord, from having the wrong spirit. We need your grace to also help us, Lord, to be good Samaritans. Those who have been mistreated, considered defiling, and yet to have compassion on the very people, Lord, who would have never offered us the same courtesy. Lord, we ask that you would, you would remember us this day, that you'll keep us close to the heart of Christ. And Lord, that we would be able to love the God whom we don't see through loving those whom we do see. The spirit of which we have manifest towards other humanity is the spirit that we have towards God. May it echo in our hearts every day until Jesus comes is our prayer in his name. Amen.